Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 3rd. Today, we celebrate the man who wrote The Flora of North America from across the pond in London, much to the chagrin of American botanists. We'll learn about the Dutch botanist who discovered the Phalaenopsis orchid and the coleus on the island of Java. In today's Unearthed Words, we'll review some sayings about the month of February in the garden. We grow that garden library with a book that helps us grow African violets. I'll talk about a decorative item for your garden, deck, or porch. And then we'll wrap things up with National Carrot Cake Day and the history and recipes of this favorite dessert. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. Botanical Interests recently shared a post featuring their Hello Yellow Milkweed, or Butterfly Flower. The botanical name for milkweed is Asclepias tuberosa, and it's commonly an orange flowering plant. But sometimes plants magically take on regional characteristics, as Botanical Interest points out with this yellow flowering milkweed that was found in Colorado. And this yellow blooming milkweed will delight your visiting monarch butterflies just as much as the orange milkweed. And the growing habit for this milkweed is the same. Milkweed are drought tolerant and they're practically carefree. Don't forget to plant your milkweed in full sun and they'll bloom for you all summer long. Botanical Interests sells seed packets of the Hello Yellow Milkweed for $3.49. And if you'd like to check out the Hello Yellow Milkweed and maybe get some seeds for your garden this summer, just type in yellow in the Facebook group for the show and this post will pop right up. Then next up was a great post that was shared on The Lantern, and it was all about Columbus, Ohio's carnivorous collectibles. The botanist William Starling Sullivan collected all around central Ohio, and one of the plants that he botanized was the pitcher plant. This article features the expertise of John Freudenstein, who's a professor of plant systematics and evolution at Ohio State. And he explains how the pitcher plant is able to capture insects. Nectar oozed by the plant attracts insects down into the cupped leaves. Then tiny hairs point down into the leaves and they act like netting on a lobster trap. And that's how insects can get in, but they can't get out. Freudenstein said they end up falling then into this little soup at the bottom and they get trapped in a mixture of enzymes, bacteria and rainwater. And then they're dissolved so that the plant can absorb them. Freudenstein shared that the purple pitcher plant is not that common in Ohio and that the only way that they can live in these wetlands and sphagnum bogs where the soil is acidic and low in nitrogen is that they have to get their nitrogen from someplace. And so the insect provides that. Anyway, I found this article completely fascinating. It's a wonderful glimpse into plant collecting, the work that was done by William Starling Sullivan, and the expertise that we've developed about carnivorous plants over the years. If you'd like to read this post for yourself, you can search for it in the listener community using the word carnivorous. And if you'd like to join the group, all you have to do is the next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar and type in the Daily Gardener community. And then our group will pop up. You can request to join. I'll get a notification on my phone and then I'll admit you into the group. 
Once you're in, you'll start to see the articles that I curate for the podcast appear in your Facebook feed. They'll be intermingled among the pictures of your friends and family. And if you'd like to share pictures of your own garden or maybe some beautiful garden poetry, I'd love that. So again, there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community and request to join. Here's today's brevities. Today in 1814, the English botanist Elmer Lambert wrote to his peer, the president of the Linnaean Society, Sir James Edward Smith. Lambert was giving Smith a heads up that Frederick Persh's Flora Americana had been published. Five years earlier, Frederick Persh had been working for Benjamin Smith Barton in America. Barton was supposed to process the plants from the Lewis and Clark expedition and then prepare a catalog for publishing. For some unknown reason, Barton never got around to doing the publishing work. When Meriwether Lewis realized that Barton really hadn't started much of anything, he hired his employee, Frederick Persh, to do the work. By May of 1808, we know that Frederick Persh had completed all of the tasks that Meriwether Lewis had assigned him. He was eager to get paid the $60 he'd been promised by Lewis and the $80 that Barton owed him for helping with his herbarium. He was also excited to keep going with the Lewis and Clark project. It seems that the mission of publishing the botanical discoveries of the expedition for the public had captured Frederick's heart. This is where Frederick's story gets a little murky. It's not clear if he was ever fully paid by Lewis or by Barton. It's not entirely clear why Lewis and Barton couldn't seem to keep the project moving forward. But records do show that over the next 18 months, two key things happened that caused Frederick to leave America with the Lewis and Clark specimens in tow. Meriwether Lewis died and Frederick Persh began to despise his boss, Benjamin Smith Barton. For his part, Barton may have grown tired of Persh's drinking. He wrote of Persh, drinking is his greatest failing. When Frederick Persh arrived in England at the end of 1811, he reached out to both Sir James Edward Smith and Elmer Lambert about putting together the flora of North America. Lambert became his botanical fairy godfather. He had a huge personal botanical library, herbarium, and funding. That said, Lambert also provided something Persh desperately needed, discipline. Persh was kind of a rough and tough guy with a swarthy complexion and a reputed alcohol problem. Historians say that Lambert made arrangements in the attic of his house, creating a workspace for Frederick. Once he got Frederick up there, Lambert would lock him in for stretches at a time to keep Frederick focused on the project. It was an extreme way to deal with Frederick Persh's demons, but it worked. Now, Smith and Lambert didn't do all of this out of the goodness of their heart. They were enormously interested in what Persh had brought with him from America, portions of the specimens from the Lewis and Clark expedition. Even with Lambert's resources and lock-ins, it took Frederick two years to complete the flora of North America. And the whole time, he was racing to get it published before Thomas Nuttall, 
who was working on the exact same project back in America. American botanists felt Persh had pulled the rug out from under them when he took the expedition specimens to England. On December 21st, 1813, Persh officially won the race when his two-volume masterpiece describing all of the plants of North America was presented to the Linnaean Society. In the introduction, Frederick was forthright about his time in America and how he had come to possess the expedition specimens. Giving credit to the work of Lewis and Clark, Frederick created two new genera, Lewisia and Clarkia, for Lewis and Clark. In all, Frederick had received 132 plants from Meriwether Lewis. 70% were brand new species that were named by Frederick. Today, roughly 30% of the Persh-named plants in his Flora Americana are still recognized as valid. Lewisia is a little evergreen alpine plant with a beautiful bloom. They like well-drained soil and are native to the Northwest. Lewisia is a perfect pick for a rock garden. And Clarkia is a little wildflower primrose that can be grown from seed after the last spring frost. Clarkia prefers to be direct sowed. They're perfect for use in mixed borders and rock gardens. Today, Clarkia hybrids are grown for cut flowers. There are links to both Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Persia's Flora Americana in today's show notes. And today is the anniversary of the death of the German Dutch botanist with the perfect last name, Carl Ludwig Blum, who died on this day in 1862. Born in Germany, but orphaned by the age of five, Bloom proved to be a bright little boy and a successful student. He studied at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, a place that would become his North Star. When he died in Leiden on this day in 1862, he had become a naturalized Dutch citizen. Scholastically, Bloom went the path of most botanists. He first became a physician, and he ran an apothecary. In short order, he started botanizing in the Dutch East Indies, especially on the island of Java, where he was the director of the Botanic Garden. Bloom wrote a spectacular book on the collection of orchids that were available on the island of Java. The title page is stunning, and it features an image of three native women from Java performing a ceremonial dance. And in the background, you see the mountains of Java and the village and a garland of orchids frames the stunning portrait. This publication is considered one of the finest works of scientific literature during the early 1800s. In 1825, Bloom established the Dendrobium genus of orchids. The genus name is derived from the Greek dendron for tree and bios meaning life. The name refers to the epiphytic habit of orchids to grow in trees. Thus, the combination of those two words, dendron and bios, meaning tree life. And here's a great story about Bloom. During his time in Java, Bloom saw what he thought was a group of moths flying in a motionless fashion by a tree. It was an odd vision, but when he got closer, Bloom realized what he thought were moths were actually 
orchid flowers. Bloom named the species Phalaenopsis amabilis. In nature, the stems of the Phalaenopsis orchid are not clipped to a bamboo pole like they are when we buy them in the supermarket. Instead, they arch away from the tree they're attached to and they sway easily in the wind. It was the motion of the orchid flowers swaying in the wind together that led Bloom to believe he saw an insect, a moth, and not a blossom. The etymology of the word phalaenopsis comes from the Latin word phal, which means moth, which is why this orchid is commonly referred to as the moth orchid. Phalaenopsis orchids are native to Southeast Asia. Their popularity has steadily grown because they are so easy to grow and because they bloom indoors all year round. This makes them one of the most popular houseplants in the world. Now, should you be tempted this summer to move your Phalaenopsis orchid outside, think twice. Just because they're a tropical plant doesn't mean they want full sun. Remember, Phalaenopsis orchids grow in the shade of trees under the tree canopy. They like indirect light. And if you put them in full sun, they will get sunburned. If you're going to move them outside, make sure to put them in a place where they will not get direct sunlight. Sometimes I'll move mine onto my north-facing covered porch. Now, in 1853... Carl Ludwig Bloom discovered another popular plant on the mountains of Java, coleus. Coleus blumii was named in his honor until it was changed in 2006 to coleus ex hybridus in recognition of all the hybrid variations. And as of 2012, the botanical name for coleus is Plectranthus scutellarioides. And coleus are in the mint or Lamiaceae family. They have that signature square stem and opposite leaves, along with other popular members of the mint family. Peppermint, basil, oregano, salvia, Swedish ivy, and thyme. An early nickname for coleus was painted nettle or flame nettle. Coleus is easy to propagate from cuttings. You can simply pop them in a glass of water, and in a few days, roots will start to form. And to encourage your coleus to grow in a more compact fashion, keep pruning them before they bloom. And you might remember that the National Garden Bureau made 2015 the year of the coleus. In unearthed words, here are some sayings about our new month, February. This first one's from Sarah Coleridge, the English author and translator. February brings the rain. Thaws the frozen lake again. Then here's one from William Shakespeare, the English author, poet, and playwright, from his play Much Ado About Nothing. Why, what's the matter that you have such a February face, so full of frost, of storm, and cloudiness? Then here's one from the American writer and naturalist Joseph Wood Crutch. The most serious charge which can be brought against New England is not Puritanism, but February. And here's one from the quotation anthologist Terry Guillaume. February is the border between winter and spring. 
And finally, here are some thoughts on February from Anna Quindlin, the American author and journalist, from her book, One True Thing. February is a suitable month for dying. Everything around is dead. The trees black and frozen, so that the appearance of green shoots two months hence seems preposterous. The ground hard and cold, the snow dirty, the winter hateful, hanging on too long. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, You Can Grow African Violets by Joyce Stark. The subtitle to this book is The Official Guide Authorized by the American Violet Society of America. This book came out in 2007. Kent and Joyce grew violets for over 30 years, and they wrote a column about it in the African Violet magazine. And all of those columns became the foundation for this book. Kent and Joyce are married and they live in Fremont, Nebraska, where they own a business specializing in African violets. And they want readers of this book to know that they killed their very first African violet too, but they soon mastered the skills that are needed for growing the plant successfully, and they eventually wrote for African Violet Magazine, which is the official publication of the African Violet Society. All of their advice came together in the columns that they wrote for the magazine, and they've been put together in this book to provide new growers with step-by-step instructions, how to keep African violets alive, or better yet, how to exhibit them in competitive shows. You can get a used copy of You Can Grow African Violets by Joyce Stark and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $5. Great investment. And here's today's great gift for a gardener. It's a beautiful 8-inch indoor-outdoor thermometer in bronze, and it's $19.99. This thermometer is easy to read. It's very decorative. It's pretty. You can read the temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit. It's got a real glass lens on the cover. It's not plastic, which makes it perfect for all different outdoor climates. And it's an Amazon choice, and it can be shipped Amazon Prime, which means it can be shipped for free. So if you're looking for a small, beautiful thermometer for yourself or for a gift, check out this beautiful 8-inch bronze indoor or outdoor thermometer and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $20. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is National Carrot Cake Day. Every February 3rd, National Carrot Cake Day is observed. And you might say it's a great excuse to have our cake and our carrots too. Akin to banana bread, carrot cake is similar in preparation and texture. It's made, like many quick breads, by separately preparing the wet ingredients and the dry ingredients and then mixing them together. And carrot cakes generally include ingredients like cinnamon or nutmeg, raisins or nuts. Carrots are, of course, a root vegetable. They're made up of 88% water, 7% sugar, and a percent each of protein, fiber, and ash. The Greeks and Romans ate carrots, but their carrots were different colors, like purple or white. It wasn't until the 17th century that carrots started appearing predominantly as orange. Now, why was that? Well, because the Dutch initially bred the carrot to be orange, 
in order to honor the Dutch royal family, also known as the House of Orange in the Netherlands. The orange carrot became so popular that the color became synonymous with the carrot. As for carrot cake, the earliest mentions of it in the newspaper appear in the early 1900s, around 1910. These early carrot cakes were more like little crab cakes, only they were made with carrots and flour and butter and sweet milk and so on. By 1912, the San Francisco newspaper, The Call, featured a carrot cake recipe and it advised that only very young, tender carrots be used, along with two cups of sugar, a cup of butter, two cups of flour, a cup of carrots that were boiled and mashed very finely, a cup of grated chocolate, a cup of chopped walnuts, half a cup of sweet milk, four eggs, and a teaspoon each of cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, and salt. By the end of November in 1913, newspapers were running an article called Carrots and Cakes. It said, The little carrot of the plebeian vegetable family moved high last week in the social scale and was in such demand on the grocery orders of so many families that stores ran out entirely, said the Minneapolis Journal. Miss Lila Frisch, a supervisor of domestic economy in the public schools, has been telling how carrots may be used for what they are or as substitutes for other things. Notably, that carrot pulp makes a good egg substitute in making cakes. And hundreds of women who formerly have scorned common truck farm products have been buying them. In the early 1980s, when Pillsbury launched its carrot and spice cake mix, they held a contest to discover the earliest published carrot cake recipe, and they were also looking for the best heritage recipe. Joyce Allen of Wichita, Kansas, won $100 for sharing her recipe from the 1929 Wichita Woman's Club cookbook. And Esther Amsler of Waco, Texas, also won $100 for creating her new recipe with Pillsbury's new carrot cake mix. She was riffing off an old family recipe. That old family recipe had been handed down through four generations. She said they didn't have it, but twice a year. Ethel's old family recipe for carrot cake calls for white raisins soaked in brandy, in addition to adding a cup of black walnuts. If you'd like to get a copy of Ethel Amsler's Heritage Carrot Cake Recipe, along with her modern twist, I've added them to today's show notes, which are available on the website for the show over at thedailygardener.org. Finally, during the 1970s, the Los Angeles Times featured a popular recipe for their 14 carat cake. That recipe incorporates crushed pineapple and walnuts, and I've included it in today's show notes as well. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.